Hi there. Welcome to the From Lab to Launch podcast by Qualio, where we share inspiring stories from the people on the front lines of life sciences. Tune in and leave inspired to bring your life-saving products to the world. Hello and welcome to From Lab to Launch by Qualio. Glad you're tuning in today. I'm Kelly, your host, and I'm really excited about today's guest. Before we jump in, just a reminder to please rate the show and share it with any of your science nerd friends. We know you have some. Also, check out the show notes if you have a story or a product you would like to share with us. Today, I'm excited to welcome Keith Woods, Chief Operating Officer at Argenix, to the show. Keith has been in the biopharmaceutical industry for over 25 years in roles that span the globe and have increased in responsibility. You can read his full bio in the show notes, but we're delighted to have him here today. The team at Argenix has created an antibody innovation ecosystem where pioneering scientists and antibody engineers work side by side to accelerate the discovery of novel targets, disease pathways, and differentiated therapeutic antibodies. We'll get more into their discoveries, culture, and how our listeners can bring about innovation by focusing more and more on the patients. Keith, thanks for joining us today. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, first of all, I love how focused our Genix is on their patients. There's even a whole section of the website that's just about the patients that you've been served so far. It's the first thing in the website navigation. Tell us a little bit more about how our Genix got started. Yeah, so uh, first of all, our Genix started as a uh, as an immunology company committed to creating products for people that are suffering with severe autoimmune diseases. We were founded in 2008 by three scientists. And truly, the desire was to utilize our antibody building technology uh, and do that in combination with academia to develop these type of products. Um, Ultimately, every single one of our genetics molecules, whether it's in our hands or in the views of one of our partners, uh, it, it was created in combination with academia. Our approved product, Vivgard, Fgard Tigamod, was actually uh, partnered with pioneer scientist Professor Sally Ward. And her work on FCRN research is what led us ultimately to FGAR Tigamod and then ultimately to our first ever approved FDA uh, Padufa date of December 17, 2021. Um, oh. Now, here we are a year later, uh, one year into launch, and we already gave, we have earnings next week, but we already. Uh, shared at the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference uh, that we delivered over $400 million in sales and we're serving over 3,000 patients living with myasthenia gravis. Oh, that's so exciting. I love, love, love. I've been in the startup space for a long time myself in my career. I'm, I'm in quality. And uh, I, I can't remember what the stats are about the percentage of drugs that don't make it all the way to the market. Um, and so congratulations on that for you guys. That is a huge achievement. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're really pleased. I have to tell you, though, um, it's a tribute to our scientists and to really our immunology innovation program, which is actually what we branded in our partnership with academia, because our hit record of our, our track record of products making it into patients um, is, is pretty solid. Uh, if you look at it, whether it's whether the product is with us and we kept it in our pipeline, like our genetics. 117, which is a complement inhibitor targeting C2, uh, or our Genix 119, which is now uh, healthy volunteers as a musk agonist, um, or some of the products that we partner with AbbVie, with, with Lidioforma and others. That's exciting. So um, looking into the next few years with this treatment and others that you have in the pipeline, what would you say you're most excited about? I think that the part that excites me the most, and it, it's really the reason why I joined this organization uh, back in 2017, uh, when when our CEO uh, called me up and said, "Keith, we we have uh, we have this asset called Emcor Tigamon, and we went through the mechanism of action, and was first in class, but ultimately what it is doing it is it is connecting to the CRN receptor." And it is therefore outcompeting IgG and pathogenic IgG, sending them into the lysosome for degradation. It, and we know there are so many IgG mediated diseases. And so, what excited me is that this product truly looks like it could be a pipeline in a product 
Um, we currently have, you know, numerous studies going on. We're in 13 different indications with f Tigamod right now. Wow, that's great. And we committed to being in 15 by 2025. So it's the totality of the patient communities that we can serve that excites me the most. That's amazing. Well, and, and two, one of the other things, you know, you talked about being, you know, first in class treatments. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it's been like to work with like the FDA being first in class? You guys working on a collaborative yeah. pathway? How's that? How's that working? Yeah, no, we really had, uh, we've had a very good relationship with the FDA uh, from the time that we first sat down with them in person, which was after our proof of concept study in phase two. We brought forward an innovative design for a phase three because DivGAC in myasthenia gravis has individualized dosing. Uh, I'm glad you call out the, pa the patients on our website because individualized dosing was not an orogenics invention. It actually came from the patients. We went and shared the data from the proof of concept phase two, and we gave different alternatives of how we believe this phase three could be set up and could be utilized. And the patients truly selected the individualized dosing. What they, all, wow. what they ultimately told us is you know, it looks like based on the data, I can take this product, I can take this product in four weekly infusions, but there's a sustained benefit that continues to last even after you've stopped, even after you finish your four week infusion. And they basically said, I would rather go for retreatment when I feel that I need it, not just go on a fixed schedule. So they liked the they liked the idea of that, you know, as one said to me, look, I can go on, I can go on vacation and not have to worry about it. Um, and that makes the, I don't want to take a medication when I feel fine. But then lastly, one said, you know, every time I have to take medication, the patient said to me, it reminds me that I'm ill. And so mm -hmm. I can have this break in between these cycles uh, and, and customize this just for me. I love this idea. And so then we took it to the KOLs and they said, to be honest with you guys, we would wind up doing that in real world practice anyway. We wind up create customizing dosing intervals and stretching them and such. And then we went and worked with payers and the payers really loved this approach because instead of just having to pay for a product because we studied it, you know, a certain way, they're paying for a product when the patient's really benefiting from it. That's incredible. That's an incredible story. Cause yeah, when it, I mean, among the myriad reasons why drugs can't get to market or don't perform well once they get there. I mean, having the patient feedback, the quality of life measures, all those kinds of things is one aspect. And then certainly the payer, the payer aspect. You know, I was talking with another um, gentleman on the pod last um, last week, and, and we talked about this whole idea of understanding, you know, what is, what's the payer uh, pathway look like? What is your reimbursement? All that kind of stuff. On the medical device side, I feel like we just don't do enough upfront to consider that. I love that you guys have brought that all in. Did you bring that in as part of that's part of your phase three, or was this sort of like specialized study pathways that didn't necessarily fit that mold? So we actually took it to the FDA, and the FDA said um, to us in the meeting, they said, "Don't you want to make this easier on yourself and potentially just dose your product every other week or however." You see, Finnick, and one of the neurologists that, that was at the FDA, he said, actually, this is how we use other medications in this disease. We customize the dosing interval. They just want to do it on label, which is a big, makes a big deal, you know, for, for my commercial team, because we can speak to individualized dosing because that is how our label exists. So yeah, that's perfect. It, it can happen with other products, but most of the time it's because you know, the physician and the patient have created it themselves, not the company. Definitely. Yeah. I feel like people don't, um, well, uh, obviously the regulatory people understand very well this whole notion of, you know, what you study is what ends up on your label and you can't do anything outside of that. But I feel like the broader public doesn't understand that, right? Why can't I just take this when I need to? Like, well, that's how it was proven out in the clinical studies, right? So, um, yeah, this is, sorry, I don't mean to rabbit hole too much here, but this is really incredible to me, given what I know about how clinical studies normally work. So I love that you guys are innovating here. That's really exciting. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's see. So I guess, you know, we do talked a little bit about the pipeline um, and you've got, man, you've got a huge pipeline going. How, how are you prioritizing that? Or, you know, did the, 
pandemic have any impact on your the speed of your pipeline and the 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 decision making around what things you were going to try to get through? Yeah, I mean a couple of things. I think first of all, with our pipeline, what we have began to do is we began to develop our organization uh, all the way from our R and D all the way through commercial into franchises. So as you know, we're, we're currently in the neurology franchise with Myasthenia Gravid. Um, we're expecting a readout on another uh, neurology uh, issue, CIDP, in quarter two of this year. Um, and so it fits into this neurology franchise. We've also started a franchise in Durham for blistered skin disorders, whether that's pemphigus vulgaris or bullets pentagoy. We now have one in um, hematology where we'll have, a, we've already had a successful phase three ITP study with f And now we're waiting for the readout of our subcutaneous f in ITP. That'll be in the second half of this year. And that will fit into our hematology franchise. And then the last one is a nephrology franchise because we're currently studying uh, both f and our Genix 117 into various uh, uh, nephrology disorders. Nice, nice. That's very exciting. I love to, uh, well, again, <laughs> drawing on my own experience in the in the startup space, um, you guys stayed focused on getting the one into market and then have expanded your indications. And and that's a good study in how it should be done, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, it's been, that, it's been a beach chain, right? We took a beach chain strategy, established, and then grow from your strength instead of having to go back and recreate the wheel every time. Definitely, definitely. Uh, well, you touched on it earlier, a little bit about the culture there at Argenix. Everyone's a co-owner. Even the name comes from an ancient myth about teamwork, right? Yeah, it, yeah, it sure does. I mean, uh, Argenix was created from the ancient myth about the Argonauts. Uh, and if you're familiar with the Argonauts story, uh, um, this was a group of people uh, that set out in a very small boat uh, on a mission to capture the Golden Fleece. And what this story is about, it's about not having any stars, having all team players. And together, a group of people aligned and focusing as a team can accomplish the unthinkable. And ultimately, the Argonauts did. And uh, that's how we built our company. Our culture is not about uh, rock stars. Our, our culture is really about we are all in this together as a team. And this goes from all the way from the bench, all the way to the bench side with the patients. And then it's cyclical because it, we take it from the patients right back to the bench. Uh, it's been one of the most fondest experiences I've had in over 30 years in the industry of really seeing a group of people that there's not a, this is my department and that's your department really is the group working together in the best interest to the end result. And the end result is ultimately to serve patients. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, you can see that all over uh, the website with the company information for sure. It's, it's a beautiful thing. What advice would you give others who are early in their biopharmaceutical careers or are trying to start a company in this industry? Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing that I think uh, about in starting this is don't put everything on your own shoulders really look to learn and collaborate with others. We can't all be experts in everything. If you pick your area of expertise, for example, you know, our scientists are expert in creating antibodies. Um, this is what we've done for our company and for others, but we are not experts on the actual disease biology. That's why we time, that's why we team up and truly partner. Don't just use the word partner, but we co-partners with the experts in these various disease areas. They help us um, even select what is going to be our lead antibody that we will then move forward with into a various disease. So that would be the first thing that I'm, I would advise. You know, the second thing, and what attracted me to our genetics is you got to follow the science. You know, it can't be pace to in motion. It's got to be following the science. It's data driven. And that was the two methods that, that the company talked about before I joined, which was you know, science-based, data-driven. Uh, when I came here and joined uh, the group, that's when I add and patient-centered uh, because, you know, they were most, most of our employees at that time, 82 people in Belgium, uh, they were all working in the lab. Uh, yeah. Yep. 
it's good to uh it's good to remember to look up once in a while right look around you know <laughs> see what's going on it's been really special because introduce bringing the patients back to our scientists you know at first when i when we started doing this they were like okay that's interesting now they're hearing from patients that are on vivgar and having tremendous results and now they connected the dots all the way through and it gives them great pride in the work that they are doing to see the difference that they're making uh you know in somebody's life somebody that told us you know i i was in a wheelchair and, uh, you know, was brought in to get my infusion, the wheelchair. My second infusion, I was brought in in my wheelchair. Um, the doctor told us this was a lady in Germany. She rode her bike to her third point. Right? Wow. So it's, wow. you're talking about really having a serious impact for people. That's incredible. Yeah. And there's no, there's no better motivator or feedback for anyone at a company to feel like you've really, uh, you know, I think a lot of us get into life sciences because we want to help others. We do want to change the world in some way, maybe we don't all want to be doctors, but uh, that's that's a really powerful story. Thank you. If you could go back to the start of your career, what would you tell yourself based on what you know now? Oh, wait. What would I tell myself? I, you know what? I really don't have regrets on how I've gone through my career. I started my career in mass market pharma uh, with Roche. And I think it was a wonderful place to learn about the business and really uh, rock solid trading. I learned a great deal about that. And then I wanted to make the change from, from Roche and get out of, because at the time it wasn't Roche Genentech, it was Roche and we were into more mass market pharma. And I decided to make the move to go to Asian. Uh, and the reason why I did that was you know, genetic-based medicine. And I thought that was the cutting edge. And I guess the advice I would always, that I would give myself is always challenge yourself. Don't, don't sit still and take things for granted. Always challenge yourself to stay more to the cutting edge. So I have thoroughly enjoyed, whether it was with Amgen or with Alexion or do with Argenics, having first in class products, and in some cases only in class uh, product. And that makes it exciting for, for, you know, for what I do on a daily basis. That is exciting. So one more fun question uh, about you. If I walked into Barnes and Noble, where would I find you? What section? You know, probably anything that has to do with the ocean, water, fishing, diving, Boating, just that in general. <laughs> nice, nice. I love it. Yeah, mine would be anything to do with horses. So I, I appreciate the, uh, uh, the 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 passion there. Sure. Well, where where can folks go to connect with you and follow along with uh, Argenics progress? Yeah, I mean, obviously they can go to our website at argenics.com. You're able to you're able to follow our progress there. Reach out and connect with us. Um, you know, we firmly believe that so many people and companies have helped us out along the way from the beginning to 2008, all the way through into this launch. I believe in networking within this industry. Um, and I did work with a number of chief operating officers and chief commercial officers. And now that we've just gone through our first launch, by the way, not just in the U.S., in 2022, we launched in the U.S., we launched in Japan, and we launched in Germany. So uh, a pretty nice accomplishment for a company that's commercializing for the first time ever. We are open to network and help others that are getting ready to go through a similar experience. Definitely. And I think uh, I think it would be an amazing case study on the, you know, again, the collaboration with the FDA and those pathways. I feel like as an industry, we don't talk about that enough, you know, being such a powerful tool um, to to help get things through, especially especially when you're first in class or you're treating rare diseases or any of that sort of uh, activity. That's um, that that's an amazing accomplishment and a really stellar example of collaboration uh, with the industry. I'm great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It's been really fun hearing your story. I appreciate you having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of From Lab to Launch. 
brought to you by Qualio. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and give the show a positive review. It really helps us out. For more information about Qualio, our guest today, or to be a guest on a future episode, please refer to the show notes. Until next time.